that we are now officially on. <laughs> yep. All right. Um, well, I will start. Um, hello and welcome. Thank you for logging on and attending this afternoon's program. My name is Matt Schumann. I am on the programming team here at Cary Library. Uh, before we begin, please let me know if there are any technical issues which I can try to resolve. You can send those to me in the chat. Questions that you have can be sent uh, via the Q&A button. Uh, this program is made possible by generous donors to the Cary Library Foundation. I'd like to now introduce Ashley Rooney, past president of the Lexington Field and Garden Club and a prolific author. Ashley has been the host of our weekly virtual gardening series since spring and through summer. Next week will be the last session before we begin again in September. Um, we'll be weekly through September and then once a month after that. Um, we've been so blessed to work with Ashley all this time uh, as she's helped bring a wide cast of gardening experts from diverse interests. So now please welcome Ashley Rooney. Oh, I could, I could like that introduction every time. I should just listen to it every day and then up my confidence. Um, today, we're going to talk about butterflies. Um, and I, just, I was so excited to have Leslie Mass on, on the program. I even looked up the quotes. And Maya Angelou said, we delight in the beauty of the butterfly, but rarely admit the changes it has gone through to achieve that beauty. And I thought that was so appropriate. Um, Leslie will tell us more about it. She's a member of the Garden Club, a good friend of the road, and here she goes. And oh, she told me if you have questions, just do the Q&A button and I'll, ent I'll interrupt and ask her the question, okay? You were on. Oh, great, thank you. Hello, I'm Leslie, and um, I have actually been raising monarch butterflies for about eight years now. And uh, over those eight years, I've learned a lot, and it's been one of the most interesting things I have ever done. Next slide, please. What we start with is the, the migration. The monarch butterfly does this incredible migration. It starts in Mexico. It hangs out in Mexico in the winter. In March, they start moving up, lay their eggs, die the next generation, goes up a little farther north, lays her eggs and dies, and it goes on four to five generations, depending. The generation that we're seeing right now is the last generation that will be born during this cycle. And what happens is they, this generation will move from Canada, the Northeast, all the way back down to Mexico and spend the winter there. Much better than spending the winter here. Um, I think. Yeah, no kidding, huh? Yep. We're at the uh, common milkweed. You're sorry. You froze for a second. I missed okay. the last half of what you said. Oh, uh, actually, oh, the last half of this, the migration thing. Yeah. Okay, so. You're frozen Mexico again. In the winter, the winter in the Mexico. Wow. Why are you freezing? Uh, we've had internet problems this morning. But it was better. Uh -oh. Still freezing? Yep. Uh oh. It says my connection's unstable. Hmm. You want to keep trying? Try right, again. Yeah. Okay. They overwinter in Mexico. We'll talk about that later. In March, they start migrating north. The first, that generation, that's the, call it generation zero, moves up north a little bit, lays eggs and dies. Then another, ge that first generation moves up, lays eggs and dies. And this goes on for four or five generations. Right now, what we are seeing is the last generation that will lay eggs here. So what happens if you go out, oh, I'm sorry, one other thing. This is a migrating population. There's also a population of monarchs that live in California, and they, you can see it in this map, they winter along the coast. And then there's a non-migratory population that lives in Florida and also parts of Cuba. 
So that if you're ever in California at the right time of year, you can actually see them hanging from the eucalyptus trees. Next slide. If you want to find monarch eggs, what you need to do is find milkweed, which there's a lot of it around here. This is the milkweed you will see most common around here. It's called common milkweed. The reason it's called milkweed is if you break leaf or snap the stem, this white milky latex comes out. And the latex is toxic. And this is the only plant that the monarch will lay their eggs on. The reason is that when the caterpillars emerge from the egg, they'll eat, they'll eat the, excuse me, they'll eat the milkweed and they'll ingest the toxins and the toxins will live in their body and it makes them unpalatable. Predators, for the most part, won't eat them. And especially for the butterflies, it will make the egg. So it's it protection. Next slide. This is um, swamp milkweed is the other milkweed you might see around here. I have never seen it wild. I've only seen the, um, what do you call it? The common milkweed wild. Next slide. So. Uh, before we yeah. uh, go on further, someone suggested that if you turn off your video, it might help your connection. Thank you for that suggestion, Judy. Ah. Thank you. You are breaking up a little bit. I'm looking. So. Okay, I'm sorry. Nope. Don't be sorry. Okay. Yeah. All right. Nothing you can do. All right. It's the internet. So yeah. let's go down to the slide with the underside of the milkweed leaf. Here it is. Okay. So the way I find milkweed, I mean, excuse me, eggs, is I go out to milkweed plants and I flip over the, um, the leaf because they almost like 99.9, .9, they actually lay the eggs underneath. They tend to lay it up higher because it's softer for the caterpillar, but that red arrow is pointing to a, an egg. The next slide. This is a close-up of the egg. It's, it's actually quite beautiful. Mm. It has that baseball, excuse me, football shape with the striations. Um, once you get to to know what it looks like, you can spot it pretty easily. The one thing with um, milkweed is that often you have little beads of latex and you mistake them for eggs. So I have tried many times to raise monarchs from latex, it never works. Yeah, Leslie, what's the horn that's up to the right? Of I th the think that's just part of the leaf. Okay. Yeah, no, the, it's, yeah, it's funny. It must be the, it is the leaf because the egg just is by itself. The next slide. I know that the lighting isn't very good on this, but this is a photograph of an egg just before the caterpillar or larva is actually going to hatch. Wow. Th that little black thing right there. So it's very exciting when you see that. Next slide. So this is a very, 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 very new caterpillar. That's part and, of the egg. And the, pardon? There's the egg, the egg that it came out of, and there's the caterpillar. That's right. Phenomenal. And it will probably eat that egg because that's, you know, high protein. That's food. Um, another way of identifying if there might be caterpillars around is that when they are baby caterpillars, when they start eating, they um, make this lacy pattern. I've never seen it quite this elaborate, but I, I have found caterpillars that way. Okay, next slide. So what I'm doing now um, is I collect the eggs or the leaves rather and put them in jars or test tubes and I watch to make, you know, to make sure that they actually hatch. And if they do hatch, then I start transferring them to larger containers. Um, you might think if you put them in a test tube, they're gonna run out of air. They don't run out of air, I promise you. Uh, so I think this was last year, and I probably had ultimately 30 caterpillars. I used to do this in my living, in my dining room. I used to have um, wine bottles full of milkweed, and I have a picture of that later on. But it, there's research that says that when you uh, raise caterpillars inside it, or actually even the, to the butterfly point, that they can't find south, that they there's so, something goes on with the directional 
signals and they can't figure out how to go south, which is what they need to do. Um, there's also studies that have said that they're smaller, they're not as strong. And if anyone is interested in seeing that, it's a study that was, it's really pretty funny, actually. A study at, um, uh, well, it was in the New York Times and I can't remember where it was. Anyways, they actually had this little thing that the, think of your finger as this mechanism that holds things down and they would put the butterfly on it with their fing, like your fingers would be on your, actually it's really hard to describe. <laughs> anyway, they managed to figure out how that they were not as strong, they weren't as orange. So there was, there's something going on when they are not outside. Uh, I'm sorry. Are you talking about the leaf that's very lacy with the holes in it, or are we? Being... No, no, I'm back down to the next one. Okay, well, Matt. I'm sorry. Next slide. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry, I misunderstood. Um, okay, so this is my setup. This is how it'll be done this year as well. That. So you see the milkweed plant. When the caterpillars actually start coming out, I'll put them on the plant and they'll start eating the milkweed. Um, I also keep them in the jars separate from each other while they're eggs because you don't want caterpillars eating other caterpillars' eggs. Oh, yeah. Which, yeah, happens. <laughs> it's, it's not pretty. And, um, and the reason I'm putting, doing it outside is research has shown that raising caterpillars and the butterflies themselves inside messes up their directional, um, the direction how to get south and they don't know why. Um, they, the way that the monarch actually know, senses the sun is through its antenna and there have been studies where they've taken the antenna off the butterfly and it, some of them still know how to go south. So they obviously have a backup system, but the sun, is the main thing that makes them fly south. Does that mm. make sense? <laughs> yes, that makes sense. Okay. And what's, it, and what's in the test tubes again? Um, individual leaves with an egg on it. Okay, and then does it get and, bigger and then it goes to the mason jars? Well, what the, well, and actually that has to do with leaf size. <laughs> oh, okay. So the thinner leaves went to the test tubes, the larger leaves go into the jars. Gotcha. And then ultimately, We'll see it a little later. I moved everything down to um, into shoe boxes. Oh. And I'll explain that why I did it that and why I do it that way. Actually, the next slide will help. There they are. So, yep, there they are. So you have an egg. Um, the first, what's called an instar. An instar is a period of time between moltings. So every time, so this tiny caterpillar is considered the first instar. Star. The second one is the second instar, and they a it actually shed its skin, and so it gets bigger. And I've never seen it until last year was the first time I'd actually seen a caterpillar molt its skin. And if you go to the next slide, there it is. Can you see? Yeah. Great shot. <laughs> I first thought one was eating another because that can happen too. But then I you know, got close enough and I realized that this is what was going on. I was so excited to see that, to tell you the truth. It was really awesome. Yeah, very intimate procedure. <laughs> so this is, next slide. I'm sorry, Matt. <laughs> so these are the shoe boxes I keep them in. And one reason I keep them in shoe boxes like this is that you really need to separate the large caterpillars from the small caterpillars because the large caterpillars eat huge amounts of milkweed. I mean, it's, you have to go out and just keep throwing leaves in there, but they'll also eat other caterpillars. And um, so I've only had that, that I know of like two or three times. So I, it's not nice, but what happens is that they, um, after they get to, oops, sorry, after they get to the larger size and are ready to become caterpillars, could you go to the next slide? They climb on something and they 
put a little like glue sticky thready thing and they go into this J shape and they're very, very still. And this, you shouldn't mess with them at this point. They're very, very still. And then what happens, next slide, is when you see a caterpillar that has in a J shape and its antenna are just about like they look dry, it means that they're ready to molt. And I think it was like two years ago, the first time I ever saw this. And this is more exciting than actually watching the butterfly come out of the chrysalis. What happens is it spl the skin splits and the caterpillar becomes essentially the butterfly. And if you look at the last photograph of, you can see the wings, the body. Oh yeah. yeah. Um, next slide. This is a photograph I took of the head <laughs> right after it had started splitting. And you can see the antenna, the eyes, it's, I can't tell you how wonderful <laughs> this That's is. Amazing. Like, weird. It is amazing. And what you what you can see is that when after the skin splits, and so you see how long well if you know the caterpillar at that point or the um, the almost chrysalis is very long and then it starts wiggling like a dance until the next slide it becomes that chrysalis, which is very beautiful. Like a jewel. It is like a jewel. They don't know why it puts the gold there, um, possibly, I think, for protection, that it, it shines and it, it's, you know, it confuses predators. Next slide. They will go anywhere to pupate. And I have found them on chairs. I have, this is when I was doing it inside. I have found them on curtains. When I did it out, when I've done it outside, they climb up the walls. They, they're they like masterminds. <laughs> you, you said the word pupate. You want to explain that, Leslie? Oh, so when it goes from the caterpillar to the chrysalis, that's pupating. Okay. So the next slide. This is how I used to raise- Your dining room. In the dining room, right. So I would have, I have milkweed and I would get stocks of it and they would eat and then they would pupate and I would take them and I still actually, I still do this because it's my favorite part. They, um, I hang them from silk strings on the, on the um, chandelier. I don't do it when they're green anymore because they're, they stay in that spot. They become, they're in the crystal state for about two weeks and I think that again, because you don't want raising them indoors, I think it would be a problem. One thing I forgot to mention is that it takes three to five days for an egg to hatch. The caterpillar lives between 10 to 14 days before it becomes a chrysalis. And the butterfly itself lives two to five weeks, except for the generation we're seeing right now. Next slide. I'm sorry, you're breaking up. I was at total time for this, from egg to the end of the butterfly is about what, six weeks, seven weeks? It's like five, I've, I've had more like five weeks and temperature plays a big role. I found that if it's colder, it, things take longer to happen. Yeah. So are we at the slide where you can see the butterfly in the chrysalis? Yeah. Okay, so what happens is when it's getting ready to come out, the butterfly starts sort of peeling itself away from the outer chrysalis. And so you can see the wings. And um, this is when I take them from the outside and put them inside. Because yeah. <laughs> you want to see what happens next. So next slide. Wow. Yeah. It's pretty amazing. And I have seen it, this takes about a half an hour. I have, you know, spent a couple, two or three hours waiting for something to happen and then walk away. And then I come back 20 minutes later and the thing is already out. So what it does is it sort of backs out and it has to hold on the whole time. It can't fall. 
and its wings are all crumpled and it puts blood into the wings. And the wings are very, very soft at this point. You shouldn't touch them. And then at that last photograph, they just hang there for hours because the, their wings are hardening up and they're resting essentially. That's amazing. It is, it's, it's incredible. Next slide. So this is a photograph of the one in the back obviously has been there for a while and then this is one that just came out and just the difference between the wings is really remarkable right i mean it's amazing that they come out of that little tiny thing next slide so the top butterfly is a female and the bottom butterfly is a male and the way you can tell the most obvious way you can tell is the male has two scent glands those little dots that females do not have. Females tend to be larger than males and their black stripy things are generally larger or wider. Do you, uh, I'm just seeing if my mouth, like do you mean these right here just so I can point? As um, scent I'm not looking at the same thing you are. So the oh. scent, <laughs> <laughs> so if you look, so do you see how that makes like a, a, a heart shape? Yep. So, and there's two little dots in the heart. Yeah. Those yes, are the scent that. glands. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, butterflies, hmm. monarch butterflies are, except for this generation, are sexually mature immediately. So the, gener the first generation and to like the fourth generation, they can start mating immediately and the females can start laying eggs almost immediately. Um, females lay between 300 and 500 eggs. It's a lot. Um, the most that's yeah. been recorded is, is oh, what? Don't they have to lay them quickly because they have such a short life. Right. Okay. Yeah. And they tend to only, each female will lay one egg on one plant, but you can find multiple eggs on a plant. You can find multiple eggs on underneath a leaf. Oh, okay. So, so if you find a milkweed that has like five eggs, that means five different females laid their eggs right there. Oh, okay. okay. So the next slide. So what I do is I tag the monarchs. There's a program called Monarch Watch out of the University of Kansas, and you buy these tags and you put them on the butterfly, it doesn't hurt them. If you think about it, these guys are gonna be flying from here all the way down to Mexico. So their wings are very, very, very strong. And there's a little, each tag has an, its own little serial number. And the idea is that if someone finds the monarch, they will report it. I, what I do is I enter the data and the data is when was it born? No, is it, wild male female and what zip code did i release it in and then what happens is that people will find these butterflies on the way down to mexico and they'll call in or when they're down in mexico the guy who runs the program hires kids to look for butterflies with um what do you call it with tags on them so that they can track where butterflies come from and you know, males do better than females, that type of data. Hmm. It's, um, and tagging first started in the 1930s, but wasn't perfected until the 1950s. And do you get results back? Um, you can't, yeah, if they can't, yeah. If you, <laughs> I, mean, I haven't, I mean, it's, it's really unlikely that you're gonna get your particular butterfly found. Yeah. And especially, um, on the East Coast, they tend not to make it, well, quote, make it, we don't know, to Mexico. So tag butterflies from the East Coast are not as likely to make it as tag butterflies from the Midwest. I have a, I have a map about that. Well, it's a longer trip, isn't it? Um, not necessarily. I'm wondering if there isn't, a, they don't go to a different place. Oh. The, yeah. So we'll go to the next slide. Minute, so. I have a question. Um, from Carolyn, doesn't the tag make them more visible to predators? It's a good question. Um, I don't know. But they, there are, I am going to tell you, they, 
they make it down there. But, um, but I'm have to, you know what? I'm going to go write the University of Kansas and ask them that question. You did say monarchs are not very tasty, so people don't, they don't really go after them. Right. They're not tasty at all. In fact, the toxin that they, um, that the milkweed produces is pretty bad. I mean, if we ate a bunch of it, we'd probably end up getting really sick. It um, affects the nerves. Oh. And it, you know, you could end up having a heart attack. I mean, no one's going to eat it. Yeah. It's, I know it's, to tell you the truth, I've had experiences with it when I was stripping, I was using the milkweed for something else and I was stripping the skin off and I had to stop doing it because my lungs, I could just feel the inside of my lungs and my eyes were burning. Oh, interesting. Yeah, it was, so I thought, okay, we'll stop doing that for now. That will claim the milkweed, huh? Um, okay, so... The you butterflies the start, pardon? You are now at the slide with the Great Migration, I believe. Yes, we're at the Great Migration slide. So all of these butterflies start moving south. And they're, sometimes the, the, there's the flocks or whatever you call them are so big, the swarms, that they have been caught on weather maps. Wow. Yeah. I've never seen anything that many butterflies, but there must come a point when it gets to that gets like that. My guess is this is actually butterflies leaving rather than coming. Um, next slide. Um, yep. So question. What's the connection mm -hmm. between the migration and the day of the dead? You always hear people talking about that. So, so the day of the dead is a, um, is a religious holiday connected with all souls and all, all saints and all souls day. And it's a very important ritual in which people go to the cemetery and they clean off the graves and they have parties there essentially you know, everyone brings their food and the family eats with their dead person and um i once asked a friend of mine who goes down all the time i said does it bother people that tourists are there watching what they're doing and he said no they like it because the more people the more it, happier it makes the dead oh, okay. the Day of the Dead happens on November, that period, you know, the holiday itself is the 1st of November and the 2nd of November, and that is when the butterflies start appearing. Ah. It's sort of like the sw swallows in Capistrano. That's when they start congregating in this reserve area. So there's a connection in that they... Um, they, some people see them as the, the, the souls of the dead. Mm -hmm. In Mayan and Aztec culture, dead and spiritual beings were often um, shown to have butterfly wings. The culture that the, where the monarchs ended up, they have no written lang they had no written language, so we don't know yeah. what they thought, you know, what their religious belief. It may have been very similar, but we don't know. Um, the other interesting thing is that we don't know how long the butterflies have actually been congregating there. There are supposedly no colonial written records of this migration. Huh. So, so there is thought that deforestation may have um, contributed to the butterflies trying to find a different place and ending up in this place. I don't know. It's something actually I want to look more into. So, yeah. I see why they would so to something spiritual. The idea oh, yeah. Oh, yes. And it's also become a huge um, income because for tourism, people come in to see this mm -hmm. remarkable thing. So are we at the Monarch Bioreserve? Where are we? And you're at the Monarch Butterfly Biosphere Reserve. Okay, so this is where they end up. And the Monarch Butterfly Biosphere Reserve is a UNESCO site and it's protected. And so, next slide. So, this is the area. And as you can see, the cities are in yellow and then the colonies are in red. What's interesting is that when the monarchs first fly down, they're sort of spread out all over the place, but then they start congregating. And so ultimately, they go from a very large area to a pretty small area, and they don't know 
why or how they know to do this. I think the re well, not why, but how they do this. But I think the reason they do it is because, next slide, they congregate on these trees and they have to keep warm. Wow, the, those are all butterflies. Yeah, it's crazy, isn't it? Um, they, the microclimate that they need is high humidity and temperatures between 32 to 65 degrees Celsius. One year they had a freeze and they lost millions of butterflies. It was pretty bad actually. So, but they bounce back. That's one thing is that the populations fluctuate quite a bit. So they'll congregate here. They're not hibernating. They're still awake. They'll go down to the floor and to the streams and do what's called muddling. They go to the mud and they, it's how they drink water and then they fly back up. So they're not completely still. They're still awake. Mm. Next slide. So what this slide shows is that most of the monsters that make it to Mexico are in the Midwest, that yellow circle. Um, you can see like some of, not so much for us, but the Midwest is the, is the big place. The, there obviously has been concerns about monarch populations. And this is pretty indicative why one of the reasons that monarch populations are in trouble, because this is the breadbasket of our country. And this is where, go to the next slide, there are vast fields of corn and soybean. And they use pesticides and herbicides to, you know, make their crops work. The pro What's interesting is that milkweed is a, a plant that grows in disturbed ground. So they love fields. So a lot of milkweeds disappeared because they use these herbicides. There, um, I was out in Iowa a few years ago and you, there was still milkweed there, but it would be on the edges of the, uh, the fields or along the roads. Milkweed is really important because as you know, we know, it's a host plant. It is the plant that is needed. It's the nursery. Think of it as the nursery hmm. of the, of the, um, of the modern, modern. <laughs> thank you. Next slide. Oh, wait, wait a minute, hold on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, do monarch butterflies exist outside the Americas? Yes, they do. They exist in, I think it's Australia. I know they're in New Zealand, but they were introduced to New Zealand, I think probably by egg. They don't know how they got there. Um, they have them, I want to say in Asia somewhere, but there are other populations. No population does, in fact, no population does the type of, um, this type of migration that the monarch does. Hmm. I mean, the, if you think about it, this, there's a generation that starts in Mexico that came from the north. Right. It would be like four or five generations back. I mean, there's like, there's this disconnect. It would be like me at the age of 13 years old, knowing how to get to Sicily using the sun. Right. With no one telling me how to do it. I mean, it's, 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 it's really remarkable. Okay, the next slide. You know, people always, as I said, always talk about milkweed, but the most, one of the most important things are other plants for the butterflies to feed on. When, and not just the monarch, all butterflies, and late fall plants like salvia, um, sedum, are really good because they're late fall plants, as I said, they are in clusters and it's easy for their little tongues to get down there to get the nectar. Um, you should, if you're going to try to make butterfly friendly gardens, what you need are lots of different plants and over an area. You, you don't want like one plant, you want a bunch of plants. I watch the monarchs here and other butterflies, you know, go from flower to flower, from plant to plant. I mean, they'll spend two hours here just popping around. So if you can't do milkweed, you should 
everyone should actually do flowers. And no herbicides, pesticides. No, yeah, no herbicides and pesticides. One thing that, so one thing I didn't mention is that the butterflies that are flying south, they don't, they're not sexually mature. They're larger. They have more fat on their body because they have to make this very long journey. The um, longest one-way journey that's been recorded was 1,870 miles. Wow. It was a butterfly that was tagged September 18th in 1958 in Highland Creek, Ontario. And it was found January 25th in San Luis Potosi, Mexico. The longest, oh. what, longest known flight was 2,880 miles. And that was a butterfly that was tagged on the 10th of September, 1988 in Brighton, Ontario, and then was recovered in, on April 8th, 1989 in Austin, Texas. So this was a butterfly that made it to Mexico, spent the winter in Mexico, and then in March moved right back up. So, I mean, that's incredible. <laughs> when they do the migration, do they ever stop anywhere? You don't have a night off? Well, they don't fly during, at night. Okay. They do fly when it's cloudy and they're, they're not sure how they do that. There are lots of theories because they don't have direct sunlight. They, at an average, they fly about 81 miles a day. And but they'll, you know, the, they'll stop and eat, but they, they don't fly at night. Okay. So find a butterfly motel. Gotcha. Right. <laughs> exactly. That's why, actually, it's funny because I've never seen one at night sleeping. So I'm trying to think of anything else. Okay. Anything else you want to know? <laughs> oh, I'm sure there's a lot more I want to know, but I'm thinking about it. There's well, one thing I have to, I should say is that although it's shown that growing, you know, raising monarchs inside is bad, you know, it doesn't work for the monarch that well. I think that if you have the opportunity to do this for your kids or just for yourself, you sh just to see that whole life cycle is really amazing. It's it's, it's actually quite profound. And to think that this butterfly is gonna end up in Mexico is, is, is remarkable. The, and the, the, actually the other thing I want to talk about the biosphere is that science didn't recognize where those butterflies went to until 1975. So it took a long time before, you know, we as a world as a whole knew where those butterflies went. Hmm. Yeah, they, people who were studying them would, followed them down to Texas and then they disappear and they had no idea where they went. So they finally tracked them down to Mexico. Well, your pictures certainly help us understand the life cycle a lot better. Your pictures are amazing, Leslie. Oh, thank you. I'm so glad you could share them with us. Any, anything else you wanna? <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, Ray Andrew says, thanks very much for your presentation. It has been terrific. It has indeed. Is that the last slide? That is, well, the last slide's, next slide is the last slide. It's this monarch on sedum, as a matter of fact. Yeah, I think I, I pulled that one up. Um, you do have a couple of questions in sure. the, um, there's one in the chat, Ashley, and then one in about um, outside the Americas. I forget if you got to, but there's two yeah, in the Q&A. Okay, there's two yeah. in the Q&A. In the chat. I don't see anything in the chat. In the Q&A, there's um, do you, about laying eggs on swamp milkweed. Okay, no, sir, I just found this too. Do okay. they lay eggs on swamp milkweed too? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, in fact, yesterday I found two eggs and two caterpillars on swamp milkweed. And one, one was a really tiny one, it had just hatched. Oh, that's great. Because yeah. I just gave uh, one member of the garden club uh, piece of the swamp milkweed to get her started on it too. And you put it in, and swamp milkweed can grow in the shade and it likes yep. connection. So it's really nice plant. You don't have to have it in the middle of your garden by any means. No. Um, Ours is, we don't have very much milkweed left. Um, we, st we actually started with swamp milkweed um, and it, the other plants took it over. I think our garden wasn't swampy enough. So no. now I'm, I'm starting to grow common milkweed and that seems to be doing okay. 
Well, there's always the very pretty, if you want in your garden, Asclepius, which is a lovely flower. And I have mm -hmm. one too, and it's orange or yellow and so forth. Uh, we have another question. Would you review again what types of flowering plants we could plant to help with butterfly health? So, any, so, you know, we, I was emphasizing the fall, but if you think about it, you should have flowers all year, all through the summer, you know, spring through summer, through fall, because it's not just monarchs that rely on them, there are other butterflies out there, like swallowtails. Um, their host plant are fennel. Um, their are question marks. Their host plant are hops. There are a lot of butterflies. So, you know, the pollinators need all of that food. But in the fall, you want things like um, salvia, sedum. This is, um, this picture here is actually a picture of a butterfly on sedum, autumn joy, which is, is really gorgeous. Uh, what else? Let Lantana. Hi. Pardon? Oh, Joe Pieweed, yep. We have a lot of Joe Pieweed. Asters. Asters are very yep. good. Asters are really good. Goldenrod um, is another one. Yep. Um, butterflies love. All butterflies, matter of fact, there are 115,000 species of moths and butterflies. I looked it up. They need lots of different types of flowering plants, less than it's quite right. They also need water. So they need, to, you can always supply yes. water. Um, now, she also wanted to read a lot of questions, so I'm going to move pretty quickly here because of the time. Also, I've heard that so-called butterfly bushes are poorly named and shouldn't be planted. Thoughts? Um, butterfly bushes are considered invasive in right. some states. They are not invasive yet in Massachusetts. Um, I know that butterflies like them. I see butterflies on my butterfly bush. Yeah, so I do I. Not that. But, she, but you... Ashley's right that they are considered invasive in some states. Oh, sorry. Bonnie wants to know is, wait a minute, Canada, Canada milkweed different from Minnesota milkweed? Swamp milkweed from Minnesota can grow in Canada. Yes. Or it may be California. Bonnie is a California well, Canada. Um, actually, the, the milkweed, so it's I've California. never seen milkweed in California, but I've seen it in Colorado, no, New, New Mexico and Colorado. And it definitely looks different. Okay. Um, yeah. I mean, the, the flower looks different. It's more floppy. It's. Hmm. Okay. Um, Judy Papo. And Judy, you were the wise woman who said to turn off her picture so we, she, she wouldn't freeze. And thank you very much for that. Ask, are there any thoughts where to get milkweed to plant in the garden? Uh, yes, you come to people like me who live in the wetlands. As I said, I just gave a plant to somebody. Uh, there were a couple people who were growing it in Cambridge. I picked up two pieces there. You can find it in the catalogs now. Uh, it is definitely there, and there are very yeah. many times. Uh, have you been buying it, Leslie, from other places? Did you know? Did you no, actually, I went out to uh, Lincoln, and I took some from Siobhan's garden. Oh, okay. <laughs> and I planted the roots. I've had tr um, trouble planting it. I found that if I just plant the root rather than the whole plant, it works a lot better. Oh, interesting. Well, yes, because if you yeah. plant the whole plant, then the, all the nurture goes to the flower of the plant right. and not to the roots. When you plant a plant, cut down that stem. The stem should be pretty short. And let the nurture go to the root. That's what you want to grow at this point. Yeah. Actually, there's a, someone's doing a study about mowing milkweed in July because you know if you mow milkweed it pops back up and it's the leaves are more tender and they're trying to figure out if the caterpillars prefer if the monarch mommies and the caterpillars prefer um, softer leaves my monarchs have never had any trouble the caterpillars eating anything okay there you know actually one last thing is that there's a group in Texas who you know grows a lot of raises a lot of monarchs and they start running out of milkweed and they have found that the fifth instar, the last instar, that they feed them cantaloupe rinds hmm. and they're fine. So Interesting. And David wants to know, what is the greatest risk to the monarch's continued existence? <sighs> That's a good question. It's actually, I think it's, well, climate change. <laughs> 
yeah. that's definitely a big one. Um, so the problem in Mexico is deforestation. That the, the area where in the biosphere, the monarchs are on a fir, they hang out on a fir tree. And so there are problems with people cutting down the trees for lumber. Um, someone has told me also for planting things, you know, for making fields. That's, that's a big, because if they lose their wintering habitat, you're going to, you know, what, what, well, hopefully they'll find another place, but what are they going to do? And then it's the whole issue of milkweed, a place to actually lay the eggs. Leslie, turn off your picture. You're freezing. Oh, I'm doing it again, all right? Okay. Everybody <laughs> met Leslie. Um, by the way, she speaks at garden clubs, and that's why we all know her. Um, and she's still there. It's just that she's freezing a lot there. I would think another great um, problem for uh, butterflies and all pollinators um, are our use of pesticides and the fact that people don't grow um, pollinator plants. Yeah. Oh, so there used to be a lot of clover. There used to be a lot of things around. There'd be lovely meadows of flowers. Now, if you look look at Lexington, you have these big houses take up most of the land. We have some nice bushes around. Not much on flowers. Not much on helping all those bees and pollinating plants. So it's something to continue to think about to sustain life and how we want it. Yeah. Last week we heard the bee lady, um, Alexander Barnes, talk about the same thing. Um, you can see her YouTube if you miss that, but it is it's a real problem. Now Sandra wants to have says, and this is interesting, Leslie, you'll like it. I met a wonderful woman scientist a couple of years ago who was called the Butterfly Lady. She was involved with the original tagging with the University of Toronto. Oh, awesome. And there isn't a question there, but it, that's- That's it, wonderful. I thought that you would like. That is wonderful. Um, do we have any more questions? There was um, a, did you grab the one from, um, the, there was one that came over from the chat. Uh, does butterfly flower as opposed to butterfly yes. weed work? Yes. You yes. got that one? Oh, but okay. <laughs> I always get that. And I see that. Does butterfly flower as opposed to butterfly weed work as a host or just for feeding? I think it's just for feeding. Yeah. It's not a host. Um, Jean Williams also says many other species of butterflies also migrate. Monarchs are just the most famous migrators. It's true. And the longest. I mean, they have the most remarkable. Well, the idea that they're going 81 miles, and you look how tiny they are. 81 miles. Well, also, yeah. That's and also, it takes five generations. <laughs> that's incredible. Well, I thank you all uh, very much. Uh, you can see why Leslie is a popular speaker. Um, next week, we'll be, we're going to have two weeks off after that. Uh, Georgia Harris, who you've met before, and I will be talking on uh, the gardening for all seasons. It will be a discussion of favorite plants, how to do it, how to do sequence of planting, and things like that. So we hope, think you'll enjoy it. Thank you, Leslie, for being with us today. You certainly You're welcome. Well, learned speaker. It was wonderful. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you all for coming. Ashley.